Welcome to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Hall from 670 The Score and the Mullion Hall Show. Dan Weeder is from the Chicago Tribune. He's up at Hallis Hall. We have a mini camp that concluded on Thursday. Everybody goes home for 40 days and 40 nights before training <laughs> camp uh, begins and everyone returns. Dan, the final day of mini camp featured Justin Fields speaking. And apparently, based on reports, you were there. I followed it via Twitter like the rest of Bears Nation. Justin Fields improving, it seems. A little better <laughs> final day throwing the football. Well, this opens up a larger conversation, David, in my opinion, about how wild it's going to be to cover this training camp when we get back here in July and August. People are looking to draw grand conclusions every single day that the Bears are on the practice field about Justin Fields. We've basically had an opportunity over the last month to watch six practices. Six practices in an OTA and a minicamp setting where there are no grand conclusions to draw, but we can take little snapshots and try to create uh, days long conversations about what they mean and what they actually signify. I did think it was interesting to hear from Justin after practice and, and, and kind of get a feel for where he's at as he goes into this 40 day, 40 night break between now and training camp. And then also hear from Matt Eberflus who, um, you know, was, was pretty specific with some of the things he's looking to um, get from Justin as he goes forward. And, and I wrote down five areas and I tweeted these out as well, because people are going to have to keep an eye on these during training camp. But Flus talked about footwork, platform, timing, release, and reads. Those are five things to repeat to yourself. Footwork, platform, timing, release, reads. Those are from the head coach's mouth about what he wants to see in his starting quarterback as he goes forward. And that'll give us a little bit of a gauge. And uh, I'll leave it there, but I do want to circle back to the conversation to get your take just on, on how weird this is going to be when camp begins and every day it gets a, a even more intense microscope than this mini camp has had. Well, we've got a lot of other things to get to, and, and certainly my own impressions from being there on, on day two. But I, but I want to explore that. Matt Eberflus came obviously prepared to describe the areas of improvement. Do you think that this is a typical coaching mantra? Do you think this was specific to Fields and he wanted to send people away with something to think about and let everyone know that there is a checklist and boxes that need to be checked? Or I guess the genesis of this, the, it's not an acronym, but it is certainly a list of priorities. And I think they're good ones. It makes sense by what you see and what he's not doing necessarily, what he needs to do. Any any background in terms of how we came up with these five areas? No, I mean, they were. I think they were just off the top of his head, honestly, in th terms of things they talk about every day. We've talked now, obviously, for the last six weeks about rhythm and timing. That's been, been a huge buzzword here at Hallis Hall as they try to get this passing game unlocked. Uh, and those are some of the things that go into rhythm and timing. Justin talked today about kind of um, mastering the footwork that they've taught him, which under this regime with Luke Getzey and Andrew Janoku and Matt Eberflus is different than what he was working on with John Filippo and Matt Nagy in his rookie season. And so when when you have footwork changes, it, it creates new habits that you have to master. And Justin talked today about his feet being sort of the the – controls of the clock in his head, you know, and his footwork being what takes him to read one, read two, read three, and trying to get a little bit more uh, efficient with that, a little bit more polished, a little more effective with that. That's going to be a big thing going into training camp and toward the preseason and the regular season for him to, to get that going. Um, and so then, then when you just talk about the release, I asked him specifically, I said, Matt, Matt talked about you improving your release and, and what specifically is he talking about? And he just talked about the speed of it, you know, just getting the ball out quicker, knowing when it needs to be in the hands of somebody else to make the play. You know, and I think that's probably a big step for Justin Fields in 2023 is understanding that sometimes as the, um, you know, the driver of the offense, your job is to just get the ball to someone else and let them do the work, you know, and you don't have to do it all. And so, so that, that is part of, Get it out, get it on time, get it to someone else that can move the ball, and then and then we'll we'll live to see another down. And and then at certain points, we're going to ask you to use your playmaking gifts as a passer and a runner to put the ball in the end zone and score points. Overall, how would you describe what he had to say and how he's uh, processing not anything maybe that's happening on the field, but the interpretation of what's happening on the field? He's not a young man that's phased by much. Yeah, but did he speak to that at all? He, he's not concerned with it. David, and I think that's one of the best parts about Justin Fields is he just really, honestly, from, from early on in his rookie season, he got in the seat, understood what he meant to this franchise, and knew that part of that responsibility is not worrying about what everybody in the outside world is is saying or judging or reacting to, and it's just staying locked into what, what your coaches want you to master. Um, 
look, Matt Eberflus again talked today very glowingly about Justin's leadership and his work ethic and his, uh, you know, the growing confidence. And those are all things that, that are awesome, you know, and, and they're not to be taken lightly. And they're, they're things you need to be a star quarterback in this league. Those boxes are checked, and we've established that those boxes are checked. No one has questions about those things. Now it's about progressing as a passer and understanding what's asked of you on the NFL level to get there, and that that's going to be the next step in this journey. Um, you know, you asked a little bit today was a very short practice, and there was you know limited red zone action. They did some some red zone running and then some red zone passing down there, a few throws down there in the red zone where where, where Justin makes a, a an absolutely brilliant throw into a tight window. For a touchdown, one to Robert Tunyon stood out today where uh, he fitted in between Eddie Jackson and Tyreek Stevenson and, and, and threw a dime. You know, he threw it on the arc that it needed to be thrown on, threw it with the velocity it needed to be thrown on. He trusted that the window was going to be there and it's a touchdown. And you say, cool, right? We can go back on film and watch that and say, this is what we're looking for. Now it needs to be more consistent. And all these things are are on the stair climb to becoming that quarterback that Chicago hopes Justin Fields is. That really is the word consistency, because I think that whether it was day three, what you just described, or day two, what I observed, and the, you know, the descriptions and reports from the first day of minicamp, the extremes are still, boy, that was a great throw that he dropped between two defenders on day two to DJ, DJ Moore, and wasn't that a beautiful long ball, because he throws it so well, to the point where then uh, uh, 10 minutes later, he's missing on, on an easy throw, a gimme, if you will, so the long passes are great. The short pass is not so great. I, I think that the range of the range of performance is still probably a little bit wider than you would want for a quarterback entering his third year. That's not criticizing. That's describing or observing. And I think that there's that, that area that, you know, that distinction that not everybody can make as a fan. But I do think that as a coach, that's the way you've got to look at it. As an analyst, I think that's the way you want to look at it because – yeah, he does a lot of things that are special, but you have to acknowledge in that same breath that, yeah, he does a lot of things that he still needs to improve on to become the kind of quarterback that he can be and maximize that potential. Yeah, look, if you're a, a Chicago Bears fan or an audience member of this podcast or, or, or people that follow this team, that you, you can go in two directions. I'll give you directions either way you want to go. You can come to the newsstand and get the the accounts of what are happening, or you can go to the Kool-Aid stand. There's about 40 Kool-Aid stands that I, <laughs> that we can send you to. You know, I, I can give you names, you know, that, that you can you can go and you can get your Kool-Aid and you can get your sugar high and you can feel great about it. You know, we saw on, I guess it was Wednesday after practice number two, Adam Hogue, a friend of the podcast and and, and obviously a, a, a longtime analyst of this football team went on the score with Parkins and Spiegel and said that, that Justin Fields had a little bit of a rough day and had some moments in seven on seven where the ball wasn't out quick enough. And he told no lies, just like Chris Sims told no lies a few weeks ago. And he got the backlash that anyone that criticizes Justin Fields in any way tends to get from a certain segment of the Bears fan base that is completely allergic to criticism of Justin Fields and completely allergic to the idea that that maybe um, there are more boxes to be checked before we give him the throne and the crown and the robe and all the things that come with being the king of the city. And so that's why I say, David, it's going to be fascinating to cover this training camp, because if this is day two of a mini camp in June and people are either saying it all matters or none of it matters or only the things that I want to hear matter, what's going to happen when we have these daily practices open for a month and a half and everybody is going to be kind of taking the, um, the, the things that happen on a daily basis and sticking them inside whatever frame fits them and go to go to Michael's and get whatever frame fits their room. Right. And, and say, this is the frame I want to put this in, or this is the frame I want to put this in. And there's going to be so many different interpretations and wildly extreme interpretations of the exact same thing that it creates some confusion amongst the masses and the people that, that want to just get a, a kind of level headed grounded sense of what's happening are going to have to filter a lot more because it's, it's, it's a wild world out there right now. And it, it, we learned that again this week. I think that's part of the noise in, in most NFL cities, probably louder in Chicago, but I don't think ultimately it has a lot to do with what's going to happen on the field. Cause I don't think that Justin Fields is going to be affected by it. Correct. I do think it makes, I do think it makes, you know, rational conversations about the growth of a year three quarterback <laughs> difficult to achieve but i don't think it really ultimately has any bearing on what we're going to see week one against the packers and no, i think right. that's the bottom line you realize that i know that but I, but i'm not necessarily we're not we're not talking to each other to to, to <laughs> make sure that neither one of us goes over the cliff i think that we're, we're safely 
you know, firmly got our feet on the ground here. I think that what happens is that you, you deal with it on such a regular basis that the reflex is to prepare yourself for the most extreme reaction or overreaction to what we see. So the 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 deep ball to DJ Moore, all of a sudden you're projecting that to he can make the Jalen Hurts like jump. And then 10 minutes later, he's missing a swing pass or putting it where, you know, the back shoulder and he needs to be in, in stride. And we're talking about, boy, he looks a lot like uh, he, he's the next Achilles Smith. So yeah. I, I think that there's a wide range there, but that reflects right now where he is. It's Correct. June. The ball should not be on the on the ground as much as it has been at some of those mini camp practices because there's no pass rush, there's no pads, there's no pressure. But I think that also in the same token, he has a gear that he can find when the pads do go on that's really hard to simulate. Well, yeah, and this is an important distinction to make, particularly as we get into training camp, because in seven on seven settings and you're talking about a quarterback that needs to work on processing, needs to work on timing and rhythm. You have nothing to divert your eyes. You know, there's no pass rush to even feel, much less see. And so your eyes should just be going boom, 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 you know, read one, read two, read three. And so when there are reps where even if it's a completion and it it goes in the the ledger as a completion, well, it's late because you hitched a little too long. You stuck on read one a little too long and it just was a little bit clunky. Those are all things that when you've watched quarterbacks at a higher level go through certain periods of seven on seven and it's just target practice you know it's just boom 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 balls out completion 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 ball never touches the ground we just got to keep an eye on that and it doesn't mean that if, if you have a couple sessions that are clunky that it that it means that the the you know the trap door is open beneath the entire organization it just means let's keep an eye on this and make sure that it is still um looking the way it's supposed to look for a quarterback that's supposed to be taking a big jump and and justin will get again it, the sample size will be huge in the month of august and we'll have a lot to judge and it, you know we should know going into september where to set the, that early 2023 regular season bar for this offense and this quarterback because their eyes will tell us where it's at so before we get to some of the sound bites you want to address, because I think some more interesting, um, over the next 40 days, did did Justin Fields lay out a plan and what he <laughs> how he plans to spend them? I, I know there have been some reports about him going to a camp in Europe. We oui, oui. Jordan Love uh, and, and, and Deshaun Watson. Is that what's happening? We oui, we oui. this weekend he's leaving. Okay. Uh, he's leaving on Friday night. Flight to France. Uh, shares an agency with, with Jordan Love and Deshaun Watson. They are going to be running a football camp this weekend in France. And Justin said he's never been to Europe. It's going to be his first trip over there. I pulled up a couple clips of the Griswolds in, in Paris just to uh, kind of remember what a European vacation can be like for a first timer. And, and so we'll see what he does over there. He seemed pretty excited to go over there. Uh, also indicated that, you know, after taking maybe a week, a week and a half off away from football, that he's going to get right back to it in July and that it's his goal to go to Florida in mid-July with tight ends, running backs, and wide receivers and 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 work on not only some of the on-field stuff, but to get some off-field chemistry built, some bonding done. And so it'll be interesting. I'm sure we'll have social media posts sometime in July that tell us who's there and who's not there and what it looks like and what the extracurricular activities are. And, and it'll be uh, an interesting kind of kind of pulse to keep on on where, where Justin is with the off-field building of, of his chemistry with his guys. Don't you imagine just – Chase Claypool being the guy who can't get through like uh, the security gate or something because he he misses the flight or there's some sort of complication or well, he's playing that gets delayed. You're also always worried about people with metal in their bodies, and so Darnell yes. Mooney's got these these, yes. these these screws in his his ankle now, and so who he's knows what that's going to do at TSA? Yeah. He may not be able to get there. He may need to take a a, a Madden cruiser down to join the group. I'm all for uh, young men in their 20s broadening their horizons. You know, everybody should go to Europe. I don't know if I would choose to accompany Deshaun Watson on my first trip to Europe. I just think, okay, Jordan Love, I could get, even though he's plays for the rival team, but um, I just, uh, yeah, that's an interesting choice for a travel companion. They work together in the off season, uh, you know, it, 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 sharing an agency and, and, and the things that go with that. Um, there are a handful of things I could say. It would probably get us in some hot water. So I'll just leave them alone for now and say that good luck to Justin in France and hope he knows enough of the language to, uh, to impart some wisdom on those young kids uh, in France that want to learn a little bit more about playing quarterback. So you mentioned Mooney. I mentioned Claypool. Jack Sanborn also had an injury that kept him out of action. Uh, Anything in terms of injuries or health concerns that would linger 
and maybe affect training camp. Yeah, the only other one that I'd point out, first of all, with Jack Sanborn, it, you know, it, it was easy to forget because we were so enamored with how he played down the stretch of last season that he finished the year on IR and had his rookie season prematurely interrupted. He seems to be the guy that they're talking most glowingly about in terms of him being ready to be ready for the first practice of training camp. So that seems to be the internal expectation here at Hellasol. Terrell Smith, the rookie cornerback that they drafted in April, uh, was banged up down the stretch here of, of minicamp and was not able to um, get on the field. And Matty Refluce expressed a little bit of, um, I don't want to say disappointment, but disappointment that, that he didn't get to see more of the rookie because I think they believe uh, that he creates a, a good competition. We, we've talked a lot this week already about Tyreek Stevenson and the way he's quickly emerged as a, a you know, probable week one starter at this point because of his competitiveness, the way he's uh, approached the orientation process, the way he's been confident and ready to roll. Um, you'd like to see Terrell Smith kind of kind of stick his hat in the ring to, to compete for some kind of role in the secondary, whether it's backup or or a leading role. Um, but that's the other one that that, that kind of stands out there. And then, uh, as you know, there's always surprises that first that first day of reporting date in late July. There's always some surprise that that pops up and you go, oh, boy, now we've got something to track here for the first week plus a training camp and injury that we didn't know about. So much focus on Justin Fields and the offense. Sometimes the defense gets overlooked. A lot of defensive players stepped forward uh, this week during yeah. minicamp, whether it was Justin Jones ripping Packer fans or Demarcus <laughs> Walker uh, really saying what he said. A lot of is, potty mouths in the defensive line room. Let's just yeah, put it that way. I wonder, <laughs> uh, I wonder where that came from. A lot of uh, bravado for a team that is coming off a 14-loss season, but that's beside the point. Um, where do you want to go with the defense and what was your overall impression uh, of their yeah. three days? You know, Alex? this this is important, David, because I think obviously we're going to keep uh, center stage spotlight focused on Justin Fields and justifiably so, because that's the, the biggest story for the Chicago Bears in 2023. But this defense is coming off a, a, a historically bad season themselves. You know, they had 20 sacks, at least in the league. Uh, they finished the year on a 10 game losing streak in which they allowed 4,080 yards and 331 points. Those were the totals, David, down the t stretch of the, the winless streak to end 2022. Obviously not good enough. You know the context. Robert Quinn traded, then Ro Roquan Smith traded, then Eddie Jackson suffers a season-ending foot injury. Then Jalen Johnson, a couple days before Christmas, gets uh, thrown on IR with with, with uh, a broken finger. And, and so they were just deteriorated and, 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 and gone, really, by the time they finished the season. Now you've got all these new faces. You've got these rookies like Tyreek Stevenson, <clears throat> excuse me, like Noah Sewell, you've got these newcomers in free agency, most notably Tremaine Edmonds, TJ Edwards, Demarcus Walker, Andrew Billings. You take a couple more rookies, Javon Dexter and Zach Pickens, and stick them on your defensive line, and now you've got a, a new vibe here. I tell people in this building all the time that, that I'm conditioned enough now to know that I don't really believe in vibes until late October. You know, because spring vibes are always good and they always it's a new feeling. We got a new energy, uh, this, that and the other thing until it translates into to consistent on field production in the regular season doesn't mean much to me. At the same time, I do think that that it is a different looking defense. They've made plays throughout OTAs and minicamp, and it's worth us just keeping our, our arms around the defense's revival efforts because it's important. It's important that this defense gets back to a level where the team can actually compete, uh, and that will be also instrumental to Justin's growth, being in games where you don't have to score 30 to win, where you don't have to put up 450 yards to keep up with your opponent. And so there was a lot to, to, to talk about this week. There was, uh, you mentioned a handful of guys that took the podium, Justin Jones, Eddie Jackson, and Demarcus Walker in particular. And let's start with with Justin Jones, who, who I, I asked a question to him about just kind of how last season stuck with him, maybe gnawed at him, given what I just mentioned with the 10-game losing streak and all of the points and yards they gave up in there. Here was his response to that question. Once the offseason kind of rolled around, I kind of like kind of just put it to, put it to the wayside. Like I just wanted to decompress. You know, it was a lot of things that transpired during that season. You know, we uh, had one of our captains, you know, traded midseason, so that kind of took a toll on the defense. You know, that's a pretty pretty huge blow, and we haven't won the game since he left. So you know, it was kind of kind of tough on us. But um, you know, then you know when we got a couple other games where you know where, where our other leader goes down with an injury, you know, so. Now we're kind of like just putting pieces in different spots, man, expecting them to go play at the same exact level. Now we can say be ready, you know, ready for your opportunity. But, you know, it's different having Eddie Jackson in the, in the, on the back end. It's different having, you know, Roquan playing behind you. It's different, you know, having certain, you know, Rob next to you and rushing off the edge. It's, it's different. You know, those are, those are key guys, you know, that you normally have. But, <clears throat> you know, now, you know, we've got a lot more pieces, a lot, a lot more depth, a lot more, uh, a lot more talent. And I'm, I'm really, I'm really excited for the season. 
I hope he has a good year, Dan. I hope Justin Jones is good. He's a very confident talker. Yeah. I, I don't know that he's had the success in Chicago to warrant some of the kinds of the ways that he talks about the Bears and the organization and the rivalry and all that. But I suppose that that's better than the alternative. You like guys to, to have a little bit of charisma and a little bit of bravado. He certainly talks a good game. Now I think that it would be terrific for everybody if he can back it up. There's no question. You heard in his voice there and his words talking about a lot more talent, a lot more pieces, a lot more depth. The Bears truly believe that they have upgraded that defense in a significant way heading into 2023. Eddie Jackson also spoke to that and was asked about the new guys. You know, I just named a whole bunch of them for you. And Eddie, Eddie, who just got back on the practice field, you know, fully uh, this week with his defensive mates, has felt a vibe all spring as he's kind of watched these guys infuse an energy. And, and, and here's some of what he had to say about about the new additions smart uh electric you know the energy uh it's just a different feel out there right now you know even me when i got back just watching it from the sideline you just see the energy uh that the young guys even bring you know and, and you know tremaine and tj those guys inside you know they was like they're like a, a staple to our defense right now so you know just continue to you know build off that momentum but the energy is high so, David, there is that high energy there, and Eddie is a guy who is, is more established here, and he's been, been here a while now and has a voice and is a respected leader in that locker room. And so I think some of the feelings that he have he has carry weight, you know, and, and you hope that, that those translate, that they, they carry over into training camp, that they carry over into the regular season, and you see what's there. I think, that to again, the eye test in, in the offseason in a June minicamp can be very deceiving. But the Bears, I think, made a concerted effort to, be, to become more athletic in this defense. And I think, obviously, whether it's Noah Sewell, the rookie, and Tyreek Stevenson, the rookie, those two guys look like they belong already. Tremaine Edmonds is, is a freak of nature, it seems. And then you see the other guys flying around. The defensive tackles outside of uh, uh, Andrew Billings, who I think is a mountain of a man, the defensive tackles look like guys who are moving with purpose and pace. And so, overall, that's the kind of – that's the kind of unit you want to try to put together. And if they're motivated by whatever it is they're motivated by, that's a bonus. But I do think they have achieved at least one thing. If they were trying to get more athletic, they certainly look like it. There's no question. And Jervon Dexter was a name that was brought up on Thursday. And Matt Eberflus uh, really basically said that he's checked the, the, the H box and the hits principle with a Sharpie and, and the way he moves and, and the way he hustles, particularly at 300 plus pounds to have that athleticism and that ability to move has really impressed the coaching staff early. And hopefully they can get some production out of that when, when the real games start, Justin Jones had one other thing to say, and, and this was, you know, it's, it's what you spoke about uh, a minute ago. This is forthright. It's candid. It's real talk from Justin Jones, the way he feels just about the, 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 the new additions and, and the different feel he has in the locker room with the current construct of this defense. It's a whole different locker room than it was last year. I, I'll tell you that. And uh, obviously now the season's over, you know, we've got a lot more guys who are uh, more team oriented versus, you know, than so, you know, when you got a bunch of guys that are on one year deals and they're all worried about where they're going to be next year, it's kind of hard to really build a tight group, you know, but when you got guys who are going to be here for three, three years, four years, you know, two years, like guys who really want to come in here and win, like, that's when you start really cooking with fire because now you got talented players and you got guys that want to be here and want to play for the Bears and it's it's gonna it's gonna be it's it's gonna be a good good deal. Cooking with fire, he is. I mean, that, he <laughs> definitely talks a good game. I, I again, you 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 hear him say these things and and you're optimistic about what it speaks to about this new energy in the building and then uh, then you take a deep breath and you think back like, what was last year? What the, weren't they bragging about the culture a year ago? But it must not have been as good as sometimes people thought that it was. And it's certainly every year with it brings new optimism. Yeah, new optimism in June for sure. And we'll see how it translates. The last guy we heard from was Demarcus Walker, who I've already given the Bobby Massey Award for gratuitous use of F-bombs because Demarcus sits, seems to throw these out often. Bobby was uh, very well known amongst the Bears Media Corps for holding uh, sessions at his locker that all of a sudden turned into uh, the blue streak, you know, and you had <laughs> you had, you had F-bombs flying this way and that way and, and this way and that way. And it was always pretty entertaining. Colleen Kane, our our colleague at the Tribune at one point went to do a one-on-one -on -one with Bobby Massey, hoping to get that show. She did like a six-minute interview with him. He didn't drop a single one, and she came away disappointed that she didn't get the full Bobby Massey experience. Well, she's going to get it with Demarcus Walker, who uh, just in, in a minute we'll, we'll, we'll hear from him, but he certainly he certainly is free to throw it around a little bit. Yeah, alert the sensors, cover your ears, kids look away, because Demarcus 
Walker has something to say. Yeah, and David, so the, to preface it, the question I asked him was, he he's obviously aware of what the Bears' defense was a year ago. He brought it up in terms of the reason he's here is because they need to enliven a pass rush that was terrible a year ago. And I just asked him kind of kind of how he um, – process joining a defense that was so abysmal in 2022 and then and this was his very very uh colorful way of of describing that uh, we, we, i forgot about that crap i mean honestly you know the first few weeks you know you see you know what has you know what we're working with what's what, what's the cause of that but man you know this is 2023 chicago bears we got a whole new di- we got a whole new identity whole new defense whole new offense whole new group of guys that's going out there willing to fight and lead. So, I mean, honestly, you know what I'm saying? Straight up, like, like last year's done. I am nominating that as the uh, T-shirt slogan of the year. Uh, bleep that bleep, last year is done. The 2003, 20, 2023 Chicago Bears. Do these guys know who they're talking to? I mean, it, it, they are in front of cameras. They are in a workplace. I know that it is... If it is not a locker room, I, I, that's a def, that's a different podcast and a topic for another day. Yeah, I, pr- I promise you, uh, Virginia and George McCaskey blushed a little bit on Wednesday, probably when they heard that and 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 didn't feel great about it. But I, you know, whatever, it's going to be part of uh, who Demarcus Walker is. He's he's earned um, the respect early from from teammates in the building. Eddie Jackson brought it up on Wednesday in terms of a guy that is a tone setter. Um, in terms of a guy who, as a newcomer, hasn't been afraid to call guys out for not working as hard as they need to work. Uh, so it's nice to have that edge. You know, I think when you you talk to players and coaches throughout the last five weeks, they, they sense a competitive spirit amongst this defense that they believe is valuable. Again, we'll see. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll gauge it throughout training camp when the pads come on and there's up more things to show and do. And then when we go to Indy again in August, uh, it'll be interesting to gauge that. But they certainly feel confident that there there is a sharper edge that is going to help them move in the direction they need to move. Speaking of sharper edges or guys who play with a little bit of nasty, Tevin Jenkins moves to left guard. He says he feels more comfortable there. We heard from Tevin Jenkins. How would you – evaluate where he is right now, Dan, before we hear from him uh, individually. Yeah, I mean, look, you know our book on Tevin Jenkins. He he had a, a turbulent start to the 2022 season in terms of not being ready at the start of training camp, trying to figure out where he was going to play, rumors persisting that he might not be with the team when, when the regular season rolled around. Then he was with the team. He got a new role at guard, didn't fully embrace it right away, then found his way to find his comfort zone at the guard position. And now, even though he's switching sides, he sees himself as an NFL guard and feels like it, it, it's time in his maturation process to embrace that and give it all he's got. He has a chance to be a very good guard in this league. But the only way that that's ever going to become a reality is if he stays on the field. I've given you the numbers previously of, of the number of games and, and, and number of snaps that he's played and the amount of time he's missed with ailment A, ailment B, ailment C, recurrence of ailment A. And, and all those things um, create an ab- availability and a durability problem that, that you've got to get past. You know, this is, this is a cutthroat industry that asks a lot of, of players, particularly in those positions, to play through pain, to – uh, avoid injury as much as you can to, to to be available every week so that you don't have this musical chairs game every single week on who's playing where on your offensive line and how is it creating instability for the quarterback that everyone wants to see become uh, the savior of the franchise. And so Tevin knows that. Um, asked him on, on Wednesday just kind of how he has approached 2023 in the offseason in terms of trying to give himself a better chance to be durable. Here's what he had to say on that topic. Just basically lengthening and strengthening muscles and uh, working on all the small muscles that you never think about. Uh, like it's like those like small interior muscles around my neck to build that up so nothing happens again so I don't get no stingers. I don't have another lapse or whatever happened. Uh, when we play the Eagles, I don't have another anything happen my back again. You know, I'm doing those muscles around the spine that make it a lot stronger so those things don't flare up. I. It sounds good, and I hope that whatever there is that he he can use as a resource, I hope he exhausts all of them because I do believe that he can be a very good guard, and I don't know if it matters what side he's on. He's a converted tackle anyway, and so he's got the ability. He's got the, the strength, and it's a matter of durability. So whatever he needs to make himself stay on the field, stay on the field because Tevin Jenkins can be an asset. And this offensive line – 
you know, it's reconfigured. It's full of new pieces. It's got two very young offensive tackles. But I think that they like what they have, and if it can stay healthy, I think they feel like it can protect Justin Fields much better than he was protected a year ago. And certainly the running game remains the strength of this football team on the offensive side, at least. Well, well, that's what, that's why the the health component of that is so significant, because right now I think they feel pretty sturdy up front with the five that they want to take to the starting gate of week one. You remember a year ago, we roll into training camp and we're meeting Michael Schofield and Riley Reef for the first time. Guys who like two days before camp started, found their way into the building over here and signed contracts. Well, this year you've got a left to right setup here that provides you a, a chance to have Darnell Wright as your right tackle and Braxton Jones on, on the left. And, and you've got your interior guys with Cody and Tevin and Nate Davis. And you feel like if you can keep that quintet intact through the month of August, well, now you're going to build this chemistry and this gel and this bond that, that goes a long way towards making your quarterback feel comfortable. And so if they can get into the regular season and they can keep that going, now, now you increase your chances of getting the offense to roll. If you have to keep changing things in and out and you have to move Jatari Carter in and here comes Larry Borum and here's whoever else might, might want to fit in this mix and Dieter Eisen, oh, hey, you're an emergency guy. We need you in here. You don't want to do that again. Chris Morgan, I think, had headaches last year with the number of times he had to go week to week to week trying to figure out who were the five stars and where were they going to play? Uh, hopefully, this group will be a little bit more intact. But again, you know, with Tevin, we haven't seen him be able to play two and a half months in a row, you know, without without falling by the wayside. And so it, it's going to be a major challenge for him. Um, and until he answers that question, it will be a big question mark. So now begins the most nerve wracking period of every NFL coach and assistant coach's <laughs> calendar. The 40 days between the end of the offseason activities and the beginning of training camp. Uh, before we get out of here, Dan, what did Matt Eberflew say about that time period and how anxious that those days really are for coaches as they kind of get away from everything? Yeah, they're quietly anxious. You know, you, you get off on a golf course, you get off on vacation with your family, and you just try to hope and cross your fingers and pray that the, the, the character of the locker room carries you through without any incidents that uh, – that, that embarrass you or, or, or set you down a, a, a negative course. The one thing that Matty Berflus did say is that the one thing he emphasized with players on Thursday morning was the need to stay conditioned. You know, they, they, they all have target weights. They all have target body fat percentages that they want to have when they check into training camp in 40 days. And it's up to these players now to adhere to that and, and be really, really dedicated to staying in shape and staying conditioned because they want to make sure that it's not uh, that a ramp up period is not really that necessary because training camp waits around for no one, particularly a Matt Eberflus training camp where they want to go up tempo, high intensity, and really get into things really quickly. Guys are going to have to come back in shape and, and, and hopefully uh, get this thing started on the right foot. Good stuff. Anything else that we missed out on before we get out of here and, and, uh, and start to look ahead at how we're going to fill the 40 days between now and uh, the beginning of training camp with content and with other things that keep things a little bit interesting. Yeah, I've got some ideas. You know, I know that we will maybe next week or the week after we can get into baby Gronk and the, and the, you know, the creation of a uh, future football icon, I guess you'd put it. And, and, and there's a segment that we introduced last week called what you doing, man, that may apply to baby Gronk's father. We can get into that in later episodes. Um, I, I, you know, Look, you you know this as well as I do. It feels like the, there's a long summer break and school's out for the summer. And then the next thing you do, you look down at your calendar and you go, oh, man, next Tuesday's report date, you know, and, right. and then you're back right. in the building and, and you're on the bus. Um, so it'll go quickly. And there's always plenty to talk about with this team. We know that uh, the content is 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 plentiful, uh, even in the deadest periods of the of the summer. Um, so I'm sure we'll we'll find some guests, some other things to talk about, and and keep it humming. But and we'll uh, get the audience. We'll we'll get some questions from the Take the North audience, just so maybe we can in, reintroduce that and and get studs involved. So maybe we can get the meatball component involved a little bit more and see what the the fan base has to say. And um, I and think we that can would be... we, we can we can release our map to the Kool Aid stands for anybody that needs that. We'll, we'll, we'll put I'll, I'll put together a graphic of the Kool Aid oh, uh, map, and, and then you'll the... you'll duck and cringe and flinch. Yeah. And go, don't do it! Don't do it! I'll duck and cringe and, and, and <laughs> kind of privately laugh, though, and be envious. All right. We better get out of here. We will be back next week with uh, some semblance of, of uh, what we're, we're going to talk about the offseason and the 40 days and six weeks or so before training camp begins. For Adam Sudzinski, our producer, for Dan Weeder, who's at Hallis Hall, and you can read his stuff at the thechicagotribune.com. I'm David Hoff on the Mullen Hall Show in 670 Score. We will talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Take the North podcast. Have a kick-ass summer.